Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the P2Y receptors. Okay, so we've discussed that there are eight different types of P2Y receptor and that they are all G protein coupled receptors. And we're now in the process of discussing the different families of G protein coupled receptors. Okay, so the first family of G protein coupled receptors is this rhodopsin family of G protein coupled receptors. And of the uh, approximately 800 G-protein coupled receptors that are in humans, around 750 of these are rhodopsin family G-protein coupled receptors. So this is a very large family of G-protein coupled receptors. Now the characteristic feature that all of these G-protein coupled receptors in this rhodopsin family have is that they bind their ligand in the extracellular one-third of the transmembrane domain. Okay, as shown here. Now, in this picture, I've shown the ligand as though it's binding to transmembrane domain 3 and transmembrane domain 4. In reality, it's what it's just, you know, in the outer third of the transmembrane region. So it's not specifically transmembrane uh, domain 3 and transmembrane domain 4. It's more uh, variable. Okay, right. Now, all of our P2Y receptors are within this family, okay, and therefore they bind their ligand in the outer one-third of the transmembrane region. So, all of the P2Y receptors are here. Okay, right. Uh, so, what we're now going to do is we're going to continue our discussion by looking at the different families of G-protein coupled receptors. So we'll continue uh, on and discuss the other four families of G-protein coupled receptors just for completion. Okay, right. So now let's go on with the second family of G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, so the second family of G-protein coupled receptors is known as the secretin family of G-protein coupled receptors. Okay. And uh, the characteristic feature that the secretin family G-protein coupled receptors all share is that generally their ligand is a peptide ligand, okay? So it's a protein rather than a small molecule. And more importantly, this ligand is going to bind in a, um, in a sort of wedge between the extracellular amino terminal domain and the transmembrane domain. So let me draw a picture for this. So, we're going to have a larger amino terminal domain than we had in the case of uh, the rhodopsin family G-protein coupled receptors. And then what we're going to have is seven membrane spanning alpha helices, which are going to straddle the cell membrane like so. So here's five, six, and seven, okay? And then you have the carboxylic acid terminus down here. Okay, and basically the ligand for secretin family G protein coupled receptors is going to bind in this wedge here between the amino terminal domain there and then the transmembrane domain below. Okay, so this is where uh, the ligands for secretin family G protein coupled receptors bind, and that's the characteristic feature that the, all of these secretin family G protein coupled receptors share. Their ligands are generally peptides, and they bind in this space between the amino terminal domain and the transmembrane domain below. Okay, now let's give some examples of G-protein coupled receptors which are in this secretin family of G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, so an example is the receptors for parathyroid hormone. Okay, or PTH for short. P for para, T for thyroid, H for hormone. So the parathyroid hormone receptors are all in this family. Okay, uh, then we've also got uh, the receptors for calcitonin. Okay, uh, again, another hormone involved in the regulation of calcium. Uh, and finally, we also have glucagon receptors, or another famous example of receptors which are within this secretin family of G-protein coupled receptors. And what you'll notice about all of these major examples is that their ligands are a peptide. So parathyroid hormone is a peptide, calcitonin is a peptide, glucagon is a peptide. Okay, so that's the secretin family of G-protein coupled receptors. Let's now move on to the third family of G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, so the third family of G-protein coupled receptors is the glutamate family of G-protein coupled receptors. And from the name, you might be able to uh, guess what the main example of receptors within this glutamate family of G-protein coupled receptors is. So not 
glutamate receptors, glutamate family. Okay, right. So let's firstly start off with the characteristic structural feature that you have, and then we'll discuss the major members. Okay, so the characteristic feature that all of these glutamate family G protein coupled receptors have is within the amino terminal domain of the G protein coupled receptor. Okay, so I'll draw this here. They have a special domain that is known as the uh, Venus flytrap domain. Okay, and they then have the seven membrane spanning alpha helices, as always, down here. And then the carboxylic acid terminus. So this portion up here in the amino terminal domain that I'm now circling in orange, this is what's known as the venous flytrap domain. Okay, so this is the venous flytrap domain. Okay, and basically, if you know anything about venous flytraps, basically uh, what happens is insects come into venous flytraps, and they're a type of plant, and basically when the insect comes in, what happens is the plant will close, okay, so there's like a cave almost uh, made by the plant's flower, and the insect can enter the cave, and then the um, flower will close around it, and that will trap the insect inside. So basically, this domain in the glutamate family G protein coupled receptors is analogous to that. And what will happen is the ligand comes in and binds here. And when it does, what will happen is those two sides will close in around it and uh, trap it inside there. Okay, and that's why it's called a venous flytrap domain. So all glutamate family G protein coupled receptors bind their ligand to a venous flytrap domain like so. Okay, now the major members then of the glutamate family of G protein coupled receptors, which I'm going to have to write up here, but don't confuse them for rhodopsin family G protein coupled receptors. Okay, the major members of this family are the metabotropic glutamate receptors often abbreviated to m -gluars. okay? So the little m here stands for metabotropic. Now, when people call receptors metabotropic, this is another way of saying that they are G-protein coupled receptors. So the metabotropic glutamate receptors are receptors for glutamate that are G-protein coupled receptors. Contrast it to ionotropic receptors, which are ligand-gated ion channels. Okay, right. So, uh, the metabotropic glutamate receptors are not the most famous glutamate receptors. The ionotropic glutamate receptors are the more famous ones. Okay, glutamate is the main excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, and the main types of receptors that it works through are the ionotropic receptors, of which there are three main types. The AMPA receptors, the kinate receptors, and the glutamate receptors. However, there is this family of receptors for glutamate that are not ligand-gated ion channels and which are instead G-protein coupled receptors. And this are, these are known as the metabotropic glutamate receptors. And there are eight of these called MGLUR1, MGLUR2, MGLUR3, all the way through to MGLUR8. Okay? And uh, they're all within this glutamate family of G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, then the other example of a famous family of receptors within this superfamily of glutamate family G protein coupled receptors is the GABA B receptors. Okay, so just as glutamate is the main excitatory neurotransmitter within the brain, GABA or gamma aminobutyric acid is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter within the brain. Okay, now again, the major receptors by which GABA works are not G protein coupled receptors. Instead, they are ligand gated ion channels or ionotropic receptors. However, there are some GABA receptors which are G protein coupled receptors, and these are the GABA B receptors, and they all fall into this family of glutamate family G protein coupled receptors. Okay, right. So, on to the fourth family then. Okay, so uh, the fourth family then, the fourth family of G protein coupled receptors is known as the adhesion family of G protein coupled receptors. Okay, and these receptors all have rather unusual ligands. Uh, 
okay? Instead of having little free molecules as their ligands, instead they have uh, components of the extracellular matrix as their ligands. So here's the amino terminus, then they'll have a large amino terminal domain, a very large amino terminal domain. Then they'll have seven membrane-spanning alpha helices, like so, and then the carboxylic acid group down here. And they will bind a portion of the extracellular matrix. Okay, so what I'm drawing here, which I'm now going to colour in turquoise, this will represent some component of the extracellular matrix. So this is ECN for extracellular matrix. Okay, and this extracellular matrix will bind to the amino terminal domain of the uh, adhesion family G protein coupled receptor. Okay, uh, so that's the characteristic feature that these adhesion family G protein coupled receptors have. They have large amino terminal domains which bind to a component of the extracellular matrix, and this is their ligand, not the more usual um, small molecule that's free. Okay, right. Now let's discuss the fifth and final family of G-protein coupled receptors. So the fifth family is the family with the silliest name. Okay, it's called the frizzled forward slash taste 2 family of G-protein coupled receptors. And the reason it's called that is it's named after the two most famous members of it, namely the frizzled receptor and the taste 2 receptor. And this family really contains all the G-protein coupled receptors that don't fit anywhere else, okay? So they have reasonably large amino terminal domains. They then have the um, seven membrane-spanning alpha helices, as always, with their carboxylic acid terminus intracellularly and their amino terminus extracellularly. Now, the ligands for these receptors are, once again, small molecules, or, you know, free molecules at least, maybe not so small but uh, they bind to the amino terminal domain. And basically, as I said, they are the receptors that don't really fit into any of the other families. So they don't fit into the rhodopsin family because they don't bind at the receptor within their transmembrane domain. Okay, they don't fit into the secretin family because they don't bind it in this wedge between the amino terminal domain and the transmembrane domain. And they don't fit into the glutamate family uh, because they don't have the venous flytrap domain. And they certainly don't fit into the adhesion family because they don't bind to a portion of the extracellular matrix. So everything that's left uh, really goes into this family. Okay, right. Now, as I said, the two most famous members of this family are the frizzled receptor, okay, which is important in the Wnt beta catenin pathway. So its ligand is Wnt, okay, which then activates the Wnt beta catenin pathway, which is important in controlling uh, cell division, okay. And then also the taste 2 receptor, uh, which is important in uh, the gustatory system, okay? And it is important in sensing bitter tasting molecules within the oral cavity. Okay, so those are the five families of G protein coupled receptors. Okay, so all of our P2Y receptors are in this first family of G protein coupled receptors, namely the rhodopsin family of G protein coupled receptors, which means that they bind their ligand in the extracellular third of the transmembrane domain, which, by the way, the transmembrane domain means all of the transmembrane alpha helices put together, basically. Okay, right. Uh, so, um, in the next video, what we'll do is we'll just start discussing the heterotrimeric G proteins, and then we'll move on to the G protein cycle.